Story behind the headlines. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, takes pleasure in introducing to you for the third successive season, Caesar Searchinger. Mr. Searchinger, former foreign news correspondent, author, and close observer for many years of the European scene, makes it his job to give you a fuller understanding of the real significance of the news. He places at your disposal not only the latest bulletins, but a summary of the historical background explaining their earliest causes. Last year, the story behind the headlines was given a first award for educational programs on any network at the Ninth Institute of Education by radio. Now, here is your speaker, Mr. Caesar Searchinger. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to be back with you. The all-overshadowing news event that's happened since I last spoke to you is the outbreak of the European War. It'll be my task, therefore, to speak to you about the background of that event, and that means Poland, first of all. Although Poland is by no means the only factor in the present war, it certainly was its immediate cause. And, one might add, it was the inevitable cause. It's almost right to say that there would have been no war if there had been no Poland. A Poland, like the seven other succession states, was created at the Peace Conference of Paris in 1919. This satisfied the nationalistic aspirations of the Polish people, but it failed to assure their economic welfare and their military security. Of course, it's easy enough to blame the treaty makers of Versailles for all the mistakes they made. But it would be wrong to say that they didn't try to make a new Europe that would work. In trying to give Poland not only territory predominantly inhabited by Poles, but also an economic outlet to the sea, they created the Polish Corridor, which cut off East Prussia from the rest of Germany. Then, when the Allied statesmen approved handing over the coal region of Upper Silesia, to help Polish industry, many thousands of German people were forced to go along too. Germany never forgot the corridor and Upper Silesia. Then, Poland antagonized Russia by pushing east, annexing several millions of Ukrainians and white Russians in 1921. Thus, she had made enemies of both her potentially powerful neighbors, which for a young, weak state was almost bound to create trouble in the end. History should have warned Poland and the Allies that this would happen. For the Polish question, so-called, has been a source of European unrest for two centuries and a half, ever since the time when Poland was ceasing to be an empire in her own right, and no longer able to hold the neighboring Slavic peoples in subjection by force of arms. At one time, you know, the Polish kings had ruled over an area reaching from the Baltic to the Black Sea. As late as 1683, one of these kings, John Sobieski, defeated the mighty Turks at the gates of Vienna. But Poland had not only been powerful. In the 15th and 16th century, she was one of the most enlightened and progressive states in Europe. Her universities flourished, and her religious as well as intellectual freedom was a freedom that was not found elsewhere. Yet by the middle of the 18th century, she had become politically so decadent that she was an easy prey to the ambitions of powerful neighbors. Now, how did all this happen? It's an interesting point, because the basic reason political and social disunion, disunion, has haunted that unfortunate country right down to the present day. From ancient times, the assertion of autonomous rights and individual freedom on the part of the land-holding nobility has stood in the way of unity and of any practical system of government. There was a diet, a parliament, in which the nobles, the church, and even the cities were represented. But, after about 1650, all decisions had to be unanimous. If a single deputy objected to a proposed law, it was not only defeated, but all the previous acts of the Diet were nullified, and the assembly was dissolved. The Diet was then said, then said to be exploded. Now, of the 55 Diets between 1652 and 1764, 48 were exploded, and nearly one-third of them by the vote of a single member. Well, government virtually ceased to exist. In these circumstances, when those two ambitious sovereigns, Frederick the Great of Prussia and Catherine of Russia, wanted to build up their power, Poland became easy meat. In 1772, Russia and Prussia took large frontier slices, and another chunk was thrown to Austria. In this way, Prussia, the nucleus of the present Germany, first got what has now become known as the Corridor. This linked up her territory of East Prussia with the rest of the kingdom, and eventually with the free city of Danzig 
the greatest East Baltic port. Now, if there's any excuse for this first partition of Poland, there was none for the second, 21 years later, 1793. The Poles had made strenuous efforts at political reform, and Frederick William, the new Prussian king, had guaranteed the independence and constitution of the country in 1791. But Catherine, that insatiable lady, marched in with 100,000 Russians, and Frederick William of Prussia, when the Poles asked him for help, just came along to get his share of the spoils. Poland was now one-third her original size, and had no seacoast, and two years later, her three great neighbor, neighbors swallowed the rest. This third and complete partition stirred up the liberal world. Kosciuszko, the Polish general who fought an hour revolution in America, tried unsuccessfully to rally the French to save Poland. Heading a Polish revolt, Kosciuszko actually drove the Russians out of Warsaw and Vilna, only to fail in the end. But the revolt did something. It kindled a new kind of patriotism among the Polish gentry and eventually inspired that national spirit among all Poles, Poles of all classes, not just the nobles, which has kept the idea of Polish independence alive for 150 years. The Polish patriots, agitating for their country's restoration, caught the European movement for national unity and independence at flood tide. French Democrats and English liberals were both sympathetic to the aspirations of oppressed peoples. Even in Germany, the cause of liberty was held high. Polish refugees became a romantic adjunct to polite society in Vienna, Paris, and Berlin. Sympathy with the oppressed Poles vibrated to the melancholy strains of Chopin's music in European concert halls and salons. Famous for their passionate bravery even then, the Poles revolted in the Russian section of their country in 1830 and 1863, and in the Prussian part in 1848. Each revolt was mercilessly crushed. But the Polish language and Polish culture survived, and most important, the Polish people increased at a tremendous rate, from 8 million in the 18th century to 20 million by 1910. The Polish question, in fact, was a ghost that refused to be laid and was a major headache to the Western statesmen in the World War. For Tsarist Russia, their ally, continued to hold the biggest part of Poland and showed no signs of giving it up, though it promised some sort of home rule. So in one respect at least, the Bolshevik Revolution was a godsend to the treaty makers of their side. For the Bolsheviks, you see, had been forced to give up Russian Poland and more at the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Now with Russia out of the way, the Allies were able to dispose of the Polish question, once and for all, as they thought. President Wilson, in his 14 points, had laid down the formula for the resurrection of the Polish state. It was to consist of all territories inhabited by indisputably Polish populations, and was to have a free and secure access to the sea. So the Polish Republic was born in 1919, and the Polish corridor was resurrected from the murky past. Also, the Germanic free city of Danzig was made free once more, and the Poles were given control of its customs. But the enthusiastic Poles wanted much more, as we've seen. They wanted Vilna, and they took it, just like that. And the new Polish army pushed on into White Russia and the Ukraine, with the help of the French. The British, however, wanted the eastern frontier of Poland to be somewhere near the line now occupied by Soviet Russia, knowing that east of that line there were more Russians than Poles. And it was interesting to read last week that the Polish government has now agreed not to demand the return of that region after the war. At least that's the report. Now, French policy after the war was aimed at keeping Germany down and Russia out of Europe. This required a strong self-governing Poland, but the Poles had no tradition of self-government. During the 150 years of their subjection, Western Europe had developed a democracy based on the growing power of the commercial middle class. Poland had no such unifying middle class. It still had the landholding nobility and a peasantry that was desperately poor. As recently as 1929, before the Depression, mind you, 93% of its population had an average monthly income of four dollars and a half per head. Nevertheless, in 1921, the Poles had democracy thrust upon them, with universal suffrage, proportional representation, and a modern parliament. Well, it didn't work. Old dissensions were revived and new ones added. 
Between 1921 and 26, no less than 80 political parties appeared, though not all at one time, and 14 cabinets struggled for power. It seemed that the Poles, after generations of opposition against alien government, had become hostile to government of any kind. Well, after Marshal Prusitsky made himself master of Poland by a coup d'etat in 1926, the parliamentary system began to decay. He was a dictator whose strong character was enough to hold the government together. When he died in 1935, there was no real leader, and the government was ruled by a clique of his followers known as the Colonels. The political parties now lost their power altogether. The leader of the largest, the Peasant Party, was imprisoned and then exiled. Civil liberties disappeared. Democracy was practically dead. The colonels became the spiritual heirs of the ancient gentry who said, we are Poland. In fact, the new constitution of 1935 is frankly based on what they call the solidarity of the elite. Now, Polish foreign policy, ever since the restoration, has been dominated by two fears, Germany and Russia, plus communism. It relied upon French help in holding her own against both. But when Hitler came to power and declared himself the deadly enemy of communism, Pilvitsky made a pact with Germany, and Poland began to play power politics on her own. Thinking that Hitler's interest in Danzig and the corridor had been deflected towards richer pickings further south, Poland, in the person of Colonel Beck, played along. When Hitler partitioned Czechoslovakia, Poland immediately recaptured a peace for herself. But Mr. Hitler, having finished off Czechoslovakia, now turned to the Polish corridor after all. He didn't even wait for the French pact to expire. What could Poland do? She was in a very tight spot. She had played Germany off against Russia, and she could obviously not ask Russia to come to her aid, for first Russia would demand back the eastern part of Poland, in which there are millions of Russians and almost no Poles. So Colonel Beck asked Britain and France to come to Poland's aid. Well... Britain and France guaranteed Poland's independence. The Germans attacked, made a deal with Soviet Russia, and in three weeks, the fourth partition of Poland was a fact. Now, that doesn't mean that Poland is partitioned for good. History shows that no peace could be a lasting peace that did not attempt an equitable solution of the Polish question. That question has haunted Europe for centuries, and it demands an answer once again. But it seems unlikely that the answer will be as simple as it was before. This time it can be neither a Poland designed to insulate communism, nor to be a link in an encirclement chain. Poor as it was, Poland had to spend one half her entire revenue on defense. The Polish question today is no longer one of national independence alone. There is also the problem of political security for a small state, of providing a more effective government, and enabling 25 or 30 million hard-working people to benefit from economic cooperation with the rest of the world. I bid you good night. Thank you, Mr. Suchinger. Ladies and gentlemen, type copies of this and succeeding talks in the story behind the headlines, together with reading lists, may be obtained by writing to the Columbia University Press, New York, or to the station to which you are now listening. Please enclose 10 cents in coin or stamps to cover the cost of handling and mailing of each or... One dollar for copies of the first series of 13 talks. Caesar Searchinger will be with you again next Friday at the same hour. This program, presented in cooperation with the American Historical Association, is a public service feature of the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York.